So we, we'd spend a lot of time as advocates demanding change in one way or another. And it's important to recognize that there's, there is actually one, one target that we need to be focusing on. It is political change. It's political action. And we're, we're very easily have our energies diluted when we go after the CEO of a, of a company or corporations themselves. That's because corporations and CEOs respond, and I don't mean to be apologetic to them, but this is the state of the world. They respond to incentives. They respond to government policy. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Summerman, and that is Grant Ennis, author of the new book, Dark PR, how corporate disinformation undermines our health and the environment. We're gonna be talking about how organizations, industries, uh, institutions use nine different devious framing techniques uh, to keep us focused on other things other than changing political structure. It's fascinating, it's a long one, so let's get right to it with Grant Ennis. Grant, it's a pleasure seeing you once again. Thank you for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Pleasure to be here, John. Thanks a lot for having me. So Grant, um, I'd love to have you just sort of uh, share with the audience a little bit about yourself. So who is Grant Ennis? I'm a lifelong uh, NGO worker. I've worked around the world in Iraq, uh, throughout Asia, D did work in Latin America and Africa, mainly focused on working with governments. Um, and I've seen quite a lot of work by corporations throughout my career to influence government policy in ways that really harm uh, public health, harm the environment. Uh, and that became the focus of a book that I recently published by the Raja Press uh, called Dark PR, um, how corporations or how corporate disinformation uh, undermines the, uh, our health and the environment. We did quite a lot of title changes towards the end there. <laughs> and I love and I love this. If I can just jump in and say, you know, I love the fact that my good friend Peter Norton is right on the front, necessary and important. And I think that's how you and I got connected uh, was uh, you and, and Peter. Peter maybe was like amplifying something that you had said out on LinkedIn and uh, we, we got connected. You reached out to me and, and uh, I'm so glad that you did. So where are you joining us from? I'm in Paris right now. I moved here recently, nice. uh, not not because of the the great urban landscape and the work of Anna Hidalgo, but it's definitely a big plus. It's a beautiful city. Fantastic. Okay. So, oh yeah, great. Another American living in Paris. <laughs> Hopefully, I can get a, a TV show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I and I laugh j in jest uh, jokingly because uh, I'm producing a lot of videos right now of me in Paris. And so I'm like li reliving the fact that I spent a couple days there in November. So it's been wonderful, uh, you know, dipping back into that video, all, all that I shot and getting that out. So I know you've been sort of following along that I've been putting those videos out. So that's good stuff. I've been watching so your, your slow rides to see if I can... Um see my house in them. I haven't so far. I haven't so far. I'm hoping. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping. No, what part of Paris are you in? I'm in the 10th. I'm near the, okay, the Republic 10th. Plaza. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. That's, that's great. Yeah, it's, uh, it, I, I try, every time I go back to Paris, I try to stay in a, a different era in Des, Des Moines so I can get, uh, you know, a, a different kind of feel for the different areas and it's all good stuff. All right, cool. Well, we are going to dive into this book because this is a really powerful book and it's a really important book. I've been trying to share this with uh, all my friends and colleagues uh, doing work in active mobility and urbanism because I think that this is probably one of the most important and most impactful texts to come out uh, in, in a long time. And part of the reason is because it really gets into our core challenge. It gets right to the matter, uh, which means we have to go right to the top. And I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to just say this up front for all the, the listeners and, 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 and all the viewers of this episode. Hang with us. You might get triggered <laughs> at some point in time because some of the things that we're going to talk about and some of the framing that comes out of this, and I'll, I'll let you tell talk more about framing and what that really means, it really starts to get to the heart of the matter in terms of how we've been duped. So with that as, as sort of a, 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 
a caveat and a warning for our, our listeners and our viewers. Talk a little bit about just from a, a, a you know, a 30,000 foot level, what you mean by dark PR. I mean, we, we've got the subtext right here, how corporate disinformation undermines our health and the environment. And uh, the next slide we're going to go to is going to get to those frames. So go ahead and just give that 30,000 foot level. So dark PR, the title I chose for this book after a lot of deliberation, because a lot of books have covered propaganda and framing um, and different kinds of spin and PR over the years. But I'm covering the ways that um, we are already subsidizing the policies whereby we're already subsidizing large scale public health and environmental problems like global warming, the diabetes, the disaster facing the earth and, and road deaths. We are subsidizing these, these problems. And then the companies and industries profiting from these problems are throwing dark PR at us. They are using uh, disinformation in order to distract us from meaningful solutions, namely ending the subsidies that they're profiting from. Right. That's the 3,000 3, uh, foot lens. I love it. And, and part of what you're talking about here, you know, talks about these nine uh, devious frames. And I think I remember a, a previous interview that you did where, you know, it was tempted to, to, to title the book, uh, The Nine Lies. <laughs> so, you know, because it really is, this is, this is cool. But before we dive into like the, these nine different uh, uh, devious frames, talk a little bit about what you mean by subsidy. So subsidies, uh, are a name or a word that uh, can be triggering for some people uh, in some of the ways that it's used or in the ways that people claim subsidies exist. A subsidy is any kind of way that uh, government policy incentivizes a corporation. And those can be monetized. So the International Monetary Fund, for example, looks at all of the different ways that corporate, I'm sorry, government policies are incentivizing fossil fuel extraction. Right. There's a guy at, at the University of California, Davis, named Mark DeLucchi, who's done a job, great job over the years of tallying exactly how much money is spent by the U.S. government to subsidize driving. And it comes to something between uh, $5,000 and $14,000 per person per year, even for the people that don't drive, like kids. The numbers are astronomical. And as an example, I, as an example, if you'll let, let me um, kind of intervene, I pulled up a slide here, which I think gets right to what we're talking about in, in like a, a few bullet points in terms of current subsidies for road builders. And that'll that'll really hit home, I think, with the audience here. So talk a little bit about, you know, with that in the context. I mean, this is how though this is what we mean by subsidies. Yeah. So you got parking minimums. So you got you have two different kinds of urban planning um, problems that are created by these subsidies. One is the absence of density, and the other one is the absence of mixed use. So for density, we're, we ban density. Density is illegal, so we're disincentivizing it through subsidies. Uh, parking minimums are one where governments make it so that uh, a given city has to build a certain amount of parking per person or per anticipated customer. Um, I mean, Donald Shoup uh, is the man that knows all about this. I don't know if you've had him on the show already, but yep, absolutely. Uh, he's, well, he's well known. Um, minimum road widths subsidize like the concrete industry. When you make roads a certain width by law, that's, that's to the benefit of the road industry that those widths be wider. So there's a huge incentive there for the road industry to lobby for that kind of thing. Same with parking minimums, minimum lot sizes, the minimum distance between the front door of your house and the street, height limits, you name it. There's, there's a laundry list of density subsidies. So when people think of single family homes, you often hear that people want them, that that's the choice. But in fact, there's not much of a choice. Right. Single family homes are subsidized and mandated by law. And similarly with bans on mixed use, single family zoning means that you can't walk to where you need to get to. It's the opposite of the 15 minute city. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I appreciate you, you, you doing that. And, and we, we can a little bit 
went out of order, but I really wanted to make sure that we, we kind of address the fact that, yes, it's more, it's broader. There's more nuance when we talk about subsidies. It's really the policies at the highest level within our governments that are, you know, preventing things, certain things from happening and banning certain things from happening, uh, incentivizing other things from happening, as well as outright giving money because <laughs> there are those subsidies yeah. that are literal actual cash being provided from the government uh, to industry, uh, you know, to, to be able to prop up said industry and, uh, and, and maybe try to stave off uh, an economic meltdown. And, and we can think of some big name examples of, of, you know, governments doing that, whether, you know, that's like propping up the agriculture industry or propping up the oil and gas industry or releasing strategic reserves from oil. These are all things that help to artificially keep the price lower so that we can kind of keep that, you know, car addiction, car dependency, uh, moving along and chugging along and, and that going. So I just wanted to make, make sure that we kind of definitely uh, talked a little bit about that. It's the subsidy, the word subsidy is, is quite broad in that sense. So, okay. So with that said, let's get right back to what we were talking about here. Um, so for those people who don't really understand, or, or they probably do understand that they, they may not, uh, know or, or be really super familiar with the use of the term frame. Talk a little bit about frames and framing and how that is, is manifests itself in, in spin. Okay. So, uh, a classic example of this is, um, pro-life versus pro-choice death tax versus estate tax. Um, you have the, the, these are different ways of framing very important issues. And sometimes they, they might not actually be issues until somebody creates this framing devices um, and puts this through a focus group. But it's different ways of portraying the same thing through a, a rhetorical technique. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. OK, so with that being said, so these are these are public relations, PR related uh, manifestations. These are part of the tool book in terms of framing. And you have come up with nine uh, devious frames. Uh, are, are these nine that you've come up with uh, uh, sort of organically or is this sort of been distilled from uh, other published literature that's out there? Uh, this is uh, each each of these individually has been covered in published lit literature ad okay. nauseum, yep. um, but I I uh, identified that they were all cross industry and put together this playbook, um, right. this this kind of matrix as you have in front of you. Yep. Um, I think a lot of the time people tend to think of these technique techniques as being something that are used only in one industry. Right, uh, right. You know, it's not it's not something that's being used by multiple industries at the same time, where, yeah. in fact, these are being used across multiple industries because the PR firms are the same. So you have the yeah, same do, PR firm that's work, working. Yeah, they do work across multiple industries. Absolutely. And I'm glad that yeah. you that, that you pointed that out um, in your book. You, you really hone in on three different industries, three different areas of emphasis. Uh, we, we really hone in on the sugar industry and you really hone in on uh, the the motordom side of things and the road deaths and, and that side. We're going to spend most of our time, uh, you know, in that realm. And you've you've done a good job of, of uh, sort of helping uh, frame some of the uh, <laughs> the discussion <laughs> framing <laughs> some of the discussion along that area, because we've been talking a lot about uh, the road deaths and the car addiction and all that. But then we also have global warming and we have that side of things as well. Well, so you've really focused in the book in those three different buckets. But as I was going through the book, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I mean, big agriculture, similar to, to like sugar, huge right there. Uh, pharmaceutical industry, plenty of it in there. So it's it's really I mean, this all is happening across all different industry types. You just happen to, to focus uh, on, on these three, because I think these three were the, the ones that, A, you know, meant something to you personally. And, uh, and, and it was probably relatively easy to get good examples <laughs> in each yeah. of these buckets. <laughs> Definitely. And it's, and it's more than corporations. You have, yeah. um, state sponsored disinformation is the same. If right. you remember when, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, first they denied they were there at all. But then they, then they post denied they were, they were doing something good. They were killing Nazis and then they normalized it. The United States does it too. 
everybody invades other countries, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. It's, these, are, these are things that are used consistently throughout uh, PR. So again, you got denialism, post-denialism, normalization, silver boomerangs, magic treatment, or, you know, it's the actual treatment of that you're doing uh, to deal with the situation. Um, and then victim blaming, knotted web and multifactorial uh, folks that are regular listeners and viewers of this podcast. Uh, many of these are going to be quite um familiar to you. <laughs> but let's start off with, with denialism. Uh, you know, this is number one, right off the bat. This is what we do is, is we, we, we just, you know, the, the very first thing that happens, whether it's a government entity, as you mentioned, like with Russia or, uh, an industry is, oh yeah, no, it, 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 that's not true. It's unsettled. That's denialism. Talk a little bit more about Absolutely. denialism. Well, I, I think we got a lot of ground to cover. The one point I want to make about denialism is that all too often, looking into disinformation and, and industry efforts, it stops at denialism. And, and that, I think that we've, gotta, we've really got to get beyond that. Climate denialism, um, denying that road deaths are a problem, that car dependency is a problem, that's just the very tip of the iceberg. And we're almost don't distracting ourselves if, by fixating on it. Yeah, yeah if, you don't, if you don't get past that, then yeah, you're, you're kind of, I pardon the pun, dead in the water. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's important, but it's uh, there's so much more. I mean, this is a this is from this is a very famous book in the road safety space. It's from like uh, early, the 1940s, and I can't see on my screen to read that little quote there. But this is a this is an example of uh, denialism of that speed is dangerous, that speed is harmful, and the author in the 40s is comp comparing it to the big lie, calling it the big lie that. They would say like, oh, speed, maybe it's dangerous, but not in all cases. Right, right. You know, but yeah. in what case you get hit by a speeding car, do you not die? Yeah. It's uh, ludicrous. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is something you're still hearing today by uh, road builders. You're hearing it from uh, the road lobby. And it's not true. I'm, I'm getting a good chuckle out of this photo itself because I see that we have our, our headphones in the background. <laughs> <laughs> nice touch there. <laughs> I, I thought you might catch that. Uh, I did catch that. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sharp like that. So we have the, the next one is post denialism. And uh, this is a brilliant uh, video from 1997. Let's hit pre pre let's hit play on this and see what they have to say. Presenting the possibilities of plastics. Plastics help save you from dents and broken bones. It helps protect my patella. They help save energy. Thin light plastics, fewer trucks, less gas. They help save you from being scrambled. They help save the soda. They help food stay fresher. Brussels sprouts? Plastics can even help save toddlers from trouble. And this vest helps save my dad's life. Plastics, plastics make, make it, it possible. possible. There we go. Post denialism. Um, the uh, the One, this is another two, version two, of it, and and this one's kind of in your face. Hi, I'm Albert Lawrence in sunny Southern California, here to talk with people about environmental costs. I'm going to find out if people are surprised to learn that plastics actually have less of an environmental cost than alternative materials. Let's go see. I want you to tell me which of these bars, the smaller one or the larger one, represents the cost on the environment that using plastic has. The orange bar. The bottom one. Yeah, because <laughs> plastic is bad for the environment. I think it's just common knowledge. Well, my friend, I am pleasantly here to shock you. Oh my God. Plastics actually cost the environment. And it continues on and on and on. Um, but really what we're talking about here in this particular playbook is uh, when we're in post-denialism is to essentially say that, no, 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 you don't understand. This is actually good for us. Yeah, it's good for us. It's going to make us live longer. Um, I mean, these videos... I remembered that plastics advertisement from 97 and I went to go look for it and I was shocked to find that other one from like 2018 or whatever it was. Yeah. The, yeah. the fact that they're still doing that. And then this, I mean, this book that you have there, I, br I brought it out um, here as well. Yeah. It's so, it's so disturbing uh, for those of the, uh, the people that are listening to this. The title of this book is called, and this is written by a fossil fuel lobbyist. 
The Many Benefits of Atmospheric CO2 Enrichment, with the subtitle being How Humanity and the Rest of the Biosphere Will Prosper from This Amazing Trace Gas That So Many Have Wrongfully Characterized as a Dangerous Air Pollutant. Right. I mean, it's nuts. And it's so easy to... <laughs> It's so easy to think of this as something that's like uh, you just laugh it off because it's ridiculous. Right. But then you go to this next image that I know you have over there. Yeah. And it's um, this became Trump industry policy. Right. You know, the Trump administration called fossil fuels molecules of freedom. Right. You know, so you can't write this stuff off. This really this stuff. It's called priming. It primes us to believe that even if this kind of stuff is nonsense, it's possible uh, it leaves the, the 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 option out there. Yeah, yeah. And for again the listening audience, this is basically just a a, a snapshot of a, a, a statement here, um, kind of a pull quote from a, a Forbes article, and it basically saying the United States Department of Energy has apparently started referring to fossil fuels as molecules of freedom. Who doesn't want freedom? And it's called and specifically natural gas as freedom gas. Hey, who, who doesn't want freedom? I mean, gosh, this is this is America. Are you kidding? Uh, <laughs> so um, crazy. It is crazy, but it's actually you know the the reason why some so much of this actually resonates is there's actually you know grains of truth in it. You know, in in the sense that yes, you know, car, fossil fuels, the ability to to do this has has. Uh, really profoundly changed uh, mankind and our world and the ability to do things and and uh, and the fact that you know yeah even plastics plastics are, are essential in being able to do a lot of things you know in, in terms of being able to uh, they're you know they're they're very very frequent in the surgical you know environment and the realm and so we're not saying that any of this is you know is just completely evil and bad and we have to go back to the stone age. Um, but at the same time, it's gone way overboard to the point where we, it's it's like literally threatening, you know, our livelihoods and, and, and transforming our environments. Uh, and, and so one of the key things that we we need to take a look at. And again, this this is one of the post denialism, uh, you know, factors here. And I'm seeing that this is zoomed in a little bit too much. So let's pull back on this particular thing so we can see the title here we've got boom safety is being used as the big lie again that word that terminology the big lie uh, to sell wider freeways talk a little bit more about this so this is a, an article by Joe Courtright who's pretty awesome I think you probably know him and this talks about something that I, I didn't put a, any other images or content in there for you but this is something that the fossil fuel industry and the the road lobby have been using for over a hundred years the narrative that if you take a, a, a road and you make it straighter, you make it wider, you make it any number of things that in fact makes it much more dangerous because it makes people drive much faster on that road, uh, that it's a quote unquote improvement. Right. And, and that's exactly what's highlighted down below here is they're trying to sell this particular uh, highway uh, project. It's the Rose uh, Highway, or, or I think that's what it's called, is the Rose, um, it, and in Portland. And they're selling it because if we do a freeway right widening, it's a safety enhancement. It's a safety improvement. Totally. And I mean, Peter Norton, I think when you had him on the show, he highlighted something he wrote about Nautorama, that the smart highways – you know, this, that's another form of post nihilism that uh, in the U.S., I think that happened in like the 60s. But Boris Johnson, I believe, um, p undertook a smart highways project in the U.K. too. They removed the hard shoulder on these freeways throughout the U.K. They removed the hard shoulder so that when you were driving, your car breaks down, you have nowhere to park. Right. Yeah. And they just and installed cameras and they called them yeah, smart yeah. highways. Yeah. And again, this is uh, this. We're still in the post denialism phase here, and and one of the things that uh, uh, this is the normaliz normalization. Um, the uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, this <laughs> caught me off guard. I was I thought I was going to get the, the the photo of the 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 dagger on the wheel, the the steering oh. wheel. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, one of one of the biggest challenges is is what we feel is safety. 
oftentimes, you know, causes us to uh, actually behave more dangerously. And, uh, and, and that's one of the, the key things that I think is, is happening. And, and we see that in, uh, and we may actually see that later in the boomerang effect. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely. Anyways, normalization, we're here at normalization. And this is where we start to get kind of interesting. So what do you mean by normalization? So normalizing, normalization is a, a process by which the problem disappears. Mm -hmm. You go from uh, no problem in denialism to, uh, to good problem with post-denialism. And then normalization yeah. is just it's, it disappears not, not because we're denying it, but because it's, it's just how it is. It's right. not a problem. That's just how it is. Um, so normalizations can sometimes come in the form of it's natural. Um, which is the case with the way that uh, framing research from the late 90s uh, by Frank Luntz. He did a bunch of uh, focus group discussions, which we'll see a, a little clip on how that works in a moment. And, and uh, he then advised the Bush White House to stop using the word global warming and to say climate change because climate change was more natural and less scary. Yeah. Uh, why don't you go ahead and say a few words to set up what we're about to see here in this little video clip? Great. So this is a, a clip from the film Vice um, from 2018, which is a movie about uh, Dick, Dick Cheney's career, essentially. Um, and this clip shows Dick Cheney participating in it starts out with him participating in a kind of conference or meeting where they're, they're discussing how they're going to reframe the estate tax as a death tax and that it was the result of uh, work by Frank Luntz, and then they show uh, how Frank Luntz runs his focus groups discussions and he, how he creates the term climate change. Unfortunately, the clip is copyright protected, so I'll be sure to include a link in the video description below so that you can access and watch it yourself. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> And, and here's an example of the normalization uh, of, of road deaths because it's happening. It happens all the time. It's like, and in fact, when, when you, when you kind of are, are trying to have conversations with people about the need for decreasing the number of uh, casualties on our roadways, um, in some, in some cases, people are just oblivious. They don't even know that, you know, nearly 115 people plus uh, per day die in traffic crashes in the United States, uh, you know, to the tune of about 43 million, 43,000 43, lives uh, annually. Uh, and then when they do there, if they do know that, then they just kind of say, well, yeah, well, it's, it's kind of the cause it's normal. I mean, this is, this is, this is the risk that we take. Talk a little bit more about this normalization effect. Yeah, I mean, you hear people saying it's the cost of progress and these kinds of things. I mean, the so all this is really the, the research from Peter Norton, Dr. Peter Norton, uh, when in, uh, is just incredible. He wrote this book, Fighting Traffic, in 2008, and it remains. Uh, it's had really long legs. It's a it's a very important book. But in do in writing that book, he went deep into the archives and found that the term accident to, to refer to road deaths was something that was created by the automobile industry sending um, pre-written newspaper articles to newspapers every time somebody died using the word accident instead of crash. Or at the time, people were using auto murder and these kinds of more flamboyant terms. There was an effort, just like in the case of changing the, the term from, from global warming to climate change, there was an effort to change the term collision, crash, motor murder, whatever, to accident. And that, that framing has normalized the problem very successfully. So when you talk about road death, people think, why is that even a problem? Um, you have public health people saying that it's a pandemic, a pandemic of road death. You have 1.3 plus million people dying per year. And yet, who cares about accidents? You know, because the framing has been so successful. Yeah. And we did have Jesse Singer on uh, the podcast in the Great past man. with her, her new book, uh, There Are No Accidents. And so uh, and I do uh, encourage everybody also to go back into the archives. I did uh, interview Peter Norton uh, with his first book, uh, Fighting Traffic. And you're absolutely correct. The, the research is just really astounding. And in fact, you know, when we he, he points out that in the United States, uh, the communities, you know, protested and came out and, and took to the streets to try to uh, create a safer environment. 
it, you know, just as we point to in the Netherlands and say in the 1970s, you know, they came out and said, stop the child murder, da, 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 da. And because of a variety of factors, it was successful over there in terms of being a turning point, heading towards more safer streets and roads. Here in the United States, uh, it was very successfully quashed in part because of these nine devious frames. So talk a little bit about this boomerang effect and the Jevons oh. paradox. Well, be, I, I'm delighted to. Before I get deep into it, though, I want to say that the first three frames we look at, we're, we're looking at, are all frames that are a little bit easy to understand. The the following frames are all proposed solutions after industry can no longer quash dissent uh, by just trying to say the problem isn't a big deal. And I'm not saying here with, with this section, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't be doing some of the things in, in industry suggesting or talking about. I'm only like, for example, ambulances, which we'll get to in a moment. We definitely need ambulances. We need a lot of things. But that industry uses these framing devices, these techniques to keep our focus away for in, from, from ending automobile subsidies. Right. So we, and, and in that sense, we really can't do both. You can't uh, propose that you vote yes and that you vote no. You know, policy always is a zero-sum discussion. So any effort to promote one frame dis distracts from another. Um, and that's, I think that's really important. And so this silver boomerang frame, which we'll get into with the, in a moment, was famously used by the tobacco industry in order to sell safer cigarettes. And so the tobacco industry created this product with the, the cigarette filter. And what happens with a cigarette filter is you inhale more deeply and you end up actually having just about the same amount of carcinogenic content in your, in your lungs. So you get really no gain. And the concept behind the silver boomerang is it's a frame where the more you, you engage with it, the more you just keep the problem going. You don't actually eliminate it. It boomerangs back on you. And so here for, for global warming, that framing is um, energy efficiency. You know, for, for well over 100 years, industry has been telling us that we don't need to, you know, stop using fossil fuels. We just need to be so efficient that we use less over time. But what happens in Jevons, Stanley Jevons in the 1890s, he realized that the more efficient you made a fuel, uh, uh, carbon, what's it called, um, a coal power plant, the more coal you just ended up using. And this is called the Jevons paradox. And there's a huge amount of research that I quote in my book to substantiate this. And it's sort of the basis to induce demand, too. We know that if we uh, add additional lanes to a roadway and make driving easier, then more people will drive. There's less friction there. And therefore, that's the reason why, um, you know, because of induced demand, we don't see that relief of, oh, well, let's just add another lane. It goes on to infinitum because you just continue to induce demand. But induced demand can be actually done for good too, because we can actually increase the amount of bike parking. We can increase the amount of bike lanes and that it makes it easier and less, there's less friction in that, uh, that process to, to try, try to support, uh, the positive behavior that we'd like to see. So. Absolutely. I mean, this is kind of a, this is exactly what NIMBYs know. In fact, they know if you create a coffee shop or a bar in the middle of their neighborhood, people will go there. Right. You know, yeah. people will walk to it. And who wants yeah. that? Yeah. Who, who wants who wants other people around us? I mean, we're we're enjoying our isolation. Yeah. We say exactly. in jest, but we understand that, uh, yes, things you, you can have the tragedy of the commons where too many people too too much can happen. Um, and that's part of what gets drummed up in terms of the fear factor and the fear mongering uh, that takes place. And, and we can probably touch upon that a little bit because it's part of the playbook. Oh, here's the photo. <laughs> yeah, this is, a, this is an incredible photo. This is Tulloch's spike. Yeah. Uh, so Dr. Tulloch was a professor, I think at University of California or University of Southern California, I can't recall, but famous for inventing this spike. He said this was the most intelligent safety device that could be invented because if somebody drove this car, they would be so terrified that they would never crash. And that is the underlying principle between, behind risk homeostasis applied in the opposite 
And I don't, I don't actually propose that we shouldn't be trying to improve safety technology. I think it would be ridiculous to say we shouldn't be trying to make things safer. I'm only saying that in the end, the, the road deaths uh, are a result of driving. And it doesn't, you don't end up really reducing population level road deaths with technological gizmos. I, I, and I mean, uh, we do find that, um, I mean, if, I don't know if you can go to this next slide. It'll, it'll help me to, to show this, or, or the next one, actually. Sorry, I put them in the wrong order. This, this is a diagram showing Atlanta versus Barcelona uh, in 1990. But the numbers are actually similar today. I just didn't have them quite as precise as I do in the book. And what you see from Atlanta from 1990 is that they have the same population as Barcelona, but they have, what is that, five times as many road deaths. Right. So Barcelona is about, um, what would it be, one-tenth the size or one five percent the size in terms of land mass. And so in Barcelona, people can walk, they can cycle, they don't need to drive, and they have 3.1 road deaths per 100,000. In, in Atlanta, you have nearly 15 road deaths per 100,000 as a result of people driving. People need to drive in Atlanta. You have to have a car. It's called forced car ownership or car dependency. And, and that's, that's just how it is. You don't have a, a choice in Atlanta. Now, Barcelona and Atlanta don't have wildly different cars. The technology is not so different to explain this 500% increase in road deaths. It just doesn't work. But, but all of that said, uh, corporations use technological gadgetry to say they can make cars uh, death-proof and say that we just need to wait until safer cars will save us. Uh, safety right. technology will save us. And if you can go back that one slide before. I was going to say, I was, you yeah. know, that, that's, that's the science promise. And, and this was a big part of, uh, of Peter Norton's second book, uh, Autonorama, too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this, this little, the screen the slide says, science promises a future free of traffic accidents. Yeah. Um, and then it shows all of these kinds of gizmo cars from the 60s uh, traveling around quite safely, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when I had Todd Littman on the, the podcast, he's like, you know, I, I, where's my jetpack? I want my jetpack. <laughs> yeah, I'm they still waiting as well. Me. <laughs> I'm still waiting. I, I do want to go back to this particular graph of, of Barcelona. Again, we know that the data is a little old. This is 1990. It would actually be interesting to see what the the, the road deaths per 100,000 population are now in, in Barcelona. At this point, it's saying 3.1 uh, road deaths per 100,000 in population. But Barcelona has actually gone through some major transformations to try to make their, their street grid even safer. Because again, I want to emphasize, cars are not banned in Barcelona, but they are managed in Barcelona. There is a car plan um, and they have launched what they're calling the super neas or the super blocks and in these nine block grids uh where the the exterior of the of of the the the, the roads around the exterior of the super block uh, is a 30 kilometer per hour zone but interior those those streets are grids of ultra slow speed so like seven uh, miles per hour right around 15 kilometers per hour in the interior and many of those streets uh, you know have diverters and and making sure that you know they're not being used by motor vehicles as cut through so it would be interesting to see you know uh, I, we're getting a little bit off topic from from the reason why this slide was there but it, that just popped into my head was that it would be interesting and fascinating and maybe unfair because it has had such a profound change in terms of the built environment yeah, I think I think there are probably two things going on with that. Uh, or what, what I'm about to say is that it's safer now. It's actually yeah. I, I know that it's like 2.5 or something like that. It's gotten yeah. safer. I yeah. think the reason why the numbers aren't more dramatic is that his, historically cities haven't been so great in counting road deaths. They've actually improved. So in, in, in 1990 in Barcelona and in Atlanta, it was probably higher for each. Right. Um, but yeah, Barcelona has gotten safer quite a lot. Well, and, and to your point too, is that even if the core of, of Barcelona where they've, they've done the, the super blocks is much, much safer. I would 
I'd be shocked to see any real serious injuries or deaths happening in an environment where the motor vehicle speed is seven miles an hour. But just like the Dutch have seen through their recent analysis, the 50 kilometer streets that they still have, the the main roads um, that are still very a little bit more analogous to our Strodes, those are the most dangerous streets that they have in their urban environments. And now they're committed to getting rid of all those 50 kilometer per hour streets because the death rates and the serious injuries are unacceptable to them, which gets to sort of their positioning in terms of at the very high level of what they mean by a systematic safety and and structures within their political uh, environment to try to, you know, do a debrief after a fatality and say, no, we need to do better. They're trying to hold themselves accountable. So that could also be happening, you know, in in the case of if Barcelona is still seeing 2.5 deaths deaths per 100,000, I would be thinking that it's got to be out on those dangerous streets, those dangerous roads where speeds are in excess of 30 kilometers per hour. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And just to just quick go back, and before we move on from that, uh, we do want safer cars. We, yeah. we want more. We're, we're not proposing to make this, folks. Safer. No way. And uh, I'm not proposing by any means that we cut investment in, in safety research or anything like right. that. But it is important to note this framing is really devious and has distracted us from improving the, the built environment and reducing vehicle kilometers traveled in, in the cities where we live. Um, I think the average American city uh, has a per person rate of 25 miles per person, uh, per day. Like that's again, inclu- including children who aren't driving, you know, that's, that's a huge amount of, uh, of distance traveled in an automobile every day. And that leads to death. I mean, Todd Lippman's research is, is right on that. Uh, Rune Elvik came out recently with a study that found that 90% of road death reductions in Norway over the last 10 years, um, were the result in reductions in vehicle kilometers traveled. I mean, it's a huge and important variable that uh, we get distracted by when we focus on techno gadgetry. Yeah. And I love just lingering on this shocking, shocking photo. <laughs> it is gory. I mean, if you, th- if you can just imagine what this is like, it's kind of what driving was like before we had the seatbelts, before we had the safety equipment, before we had airbags. It was, it was actually quite scary to be driving because if you did have a crash, if you had a collision, um, if a mistake happened, there was a very good likelihood that there was going to be serious injury and or death. And so, yes, I'm with you. I, I don't want to go back to the dark ages of you know, quote unquote, death traps as automobiles. But at the same time, the point of this photo really is if you knew that when you were driving, you know, and and you made a mistake and you had a collision, death would occur, you know, even if it meant for you or your loved ones, would you, would that change your behavior? And, you know, so, so that's part of it, but we're going to get to it later. That is part of one of the devious frames that is also about kind of shifting the blame. So we're, we're going to get to that later, <laughs> but we're going to talk about magic right now. So the magic frame, and now we're, we're going to start with carbon capture storage. Yeah. I hated writing this chapter. I hated doing the research. The whole thing is just so ridiculous. I didn't even know where to begin. So many people have already talked about it. Um, I can't believe that the U S government just invested more money in this. It's throwing, um, bad money after bad money. Yeah, it's the, the idea that we can just take energy and use it to on machines that will pump emissions back under the ground. It's 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 crazy. I, maybe I'll, I'll pass it to you, John, if you have anything to say there. It just makes no sense. Well, I, I, that's I, the I magic that, frame for global. I, I think that the magic frame we should switch right over into uh, Peter Norton's world of of Otanorama and 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 talking about the fact that yeah, we've this is this is a frame that's been sold to us, uh, you know, forever. This is a 1956 advert. So let's take a listen and, and watch this. Ah, drat. Uh, Sorry, folks, we can't show you this video after all. Uh, But here are some stills uh, to give you an idea of what it's all about. I'll be sure to put the video link in the description below. It 
really what we're talking about in that particular frame there is that, yeah, the magic solution, technology is going to save us and we can just sit back and have a cigar while we're riding in our hermetically sealed uh, metal box uh, on our automatic. Uh, did you notice that that was a, uh, a barrier protected fast lane? <laughs> I think they might, I remember reading about how they filmed that and I think they might have filmed part of it with like actually a remote controlled car at the time. Yeah. So for the listeners, you're not going to be able, you didn't see the image or the video, but they do this motion where they drive very close to an impaling object. Yeah. And I just was thinking to myself, they (laughs) must have put those people's lives in danger just to film this nonsense. Um, (laughs) Craziness. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> uh, so now we, we, we're shifting over to uh, the, the concept of treatment. So, you know, you know, if something happens, well, we got to do something. So we gotta, we, we've got to respond to this terrible thing that's happening. Talk a little bit more about treatment. So treatment frame is it's medical care instead of medical prevention. In the case of global warming, it's adapting to global warming rather than uh, stopping it rather than mitigating it. And it's corporations have promoted this idea that we need to be doing both. But in fact, the more we mitigate global warming now, the more we are adapting. We don't have to adapt as much. So by just by mitigating, we're focusing on adaptation. But again, adaptation is just, it's something that we definitely are going to have to do in every place in the world, but all cities are already doing it. So when corporations are focusing on this thing, it's kind of like, um, to me, it's ignoring the fact that everybody is doing it by default. But but by default, we are not mitigating climate change. We're not global warming, sorry. And so here you have George, we have quote, two quotes on screen. George Woodell, he's the co-founder of the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and he said, uh, adaptation is the far preferable policy for the largest and richest corporations in the world. And then we've got this other quote from uh, Gavin Newsom where he's saying Trump's doing everything right to respond to the, the these disasters. He's referring to the fires, I think, in 2019 in California, and everything wrong to address what's happening to cause them. And this focus on adaptation it really comes, at least in media, really does come at the detriment to stopping global warming. It's very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. Ah, prevention, taking me back to my uh, original career. Thank you very much. <laughs> Again, treatment uh, is, is here. And uh, when it comes to road safety, uh, Ralph Nader is, is one of, uh, you know, the, the, the folks early on back in uh, 1965, the day I was, or the year I was born, uh, this particular comment, follow, follow through on that. So Nate, right, Ralph Nader wrote in and Safe in Any Speed, the true mark of a humane society must be what it does about prevention of accident injuries, not the cleaning up of them afterward. And he's, he's saying we need to be preventing these crashes. I don't think anybody's saying we should stop investing in ambulances. But you have automobile corporations all around the world constantly as their primary CSR activity, donating ambulances. It's, a, it's, an, it's like you imagine a, a drug dealer, what would it be, giving out methadone along with the drugs you know, use this one for later. Uh, it's a, it's a framing technique. It's very successful. I had to chuckle too, when I saw the, this quote from, from Ralph and, and, uh, when he said prevention of accident, I'm like, Oh, yep. He was brainwashed too. <laughs> it's, and that's us. the whole point is it's insidious. It's so incredibly powerful. The reframing of, you know, you know, yeah, let's, let's not call it global warming. Let's call it climate change. Let's not call it a collision or a crash. Let's call it an accident. Incredibly effective. And sticky. Mm. Yeah, it is sticky. Um, we don't have time to, 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 to play this, this whole thing here. Um, or actually we do have time to play this one. This one's, this one's short. This one is Brilliant. Brilliant. It, it's brilliant because it's, it's, it's a form of victim blaming and we see victim blaming all the time, uh, especially in the road safety a- arena in the, the reports from the journalism. It's, it's like, Oh, were they wearing dark clothing? Uh, you know, did the, the cyclists have a helmet on? These are all 
very, you know, not so subtle victim blaming now that we, we can see it. But, you know, this is also a form of victim blaming the carbon footprint and the fact that literally that was a manifestation of corporate industry. That was a manifestation of uh, BP. And that's what this graph is, is indicating is that, you know, nobody was looking up global warming on Google until 2005 <laughs> or, or carbon footprint until 2005. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, BP, you had the term ecological footprint kind of bouncing around in academic circles. And BP heard about it, latched onto it, and created this campaign in 2005, essentially, to, to focus on carbon footprint. They spent millions and millions of dollars on this campaign. The term and the campaign associated with it won a, a big PR award that year, actually, which is crazy to think that PR awards are given out for uh, this kind of stuff. And it's been very successful. And the, it's not that individuals can't take action on global warming, but they need to be actions oriented in changing the political system, by the actions oriented towards organizing for political action and uh, getting people to not look upwards towards their political structures and look downwards towards their feet right. is genius. Oh, it's genius. It's That's why I said genius. it was brilliant. I mean, it's just absolutely. And again, it, this continues, um, you know, here in terms of, yeah, I mean, they're, they're literally just kind of laying it all out here for us. You know, uh, next we we introduced the, the, the data or the idea of a carbon footprint before it was common buzzword and da, da, da. It just it just takes off. Wait a minute. We, we need to hire these guys. <laughs> We need to hire these guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so this is the one we won't uh, go too far into, but it's another form of victim blaming. Um, and, and literally uh, this particular uh, video leans into the fact that they're shaming people who are the victims. And, and it's, it's several individuals. It's like nine individuals, right? that were, were hit and had amputations and, and et cetera. And, and they were the victims of, of these traffic crashes, these, et cetera. But they're literally leaning into and blaming them. Uh, or, or, you know, they've been basically brainwashed into believing that, you know, they are really the sole reason that they are in the situation that they're in. Exactly. And it's, it's Buick Motor Cars created this campaign where they, yeah. they took nine people in China who were victims of, of injuries, of crashes. Yeah. And uh, there were amputee victims and uh, wheelchairs and on stilts. And it took, Buick took them to dangerous places throughout China to stand mm -hmm. in the middle of high-speed, busy intersections and filmed them standing on one crutch with right. signs and, and, and the, the end of the, the, the spot campaign says, signs are there for a reason, obey the rules. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a tearjerker when you, when you realize what it is. I'll, we'll, we'll have to post the, the link, I suppose, for your viewers yeah. and listeners. Yeah. But really, uh, really horribly good example of, of victim blaming. And yeah. I, I need to, I should underscore that these kinds of framing devices and, and the PR uh, focus groups that went into them, a lot of research has gone into them and a lot of research has been done on how these frames affect political will for action. Right. We know that the more you're exposed to environmentally individualist messaging like carbon footprint, the more that you're exposed to uh, carbon capture storage, to victim blaming the victims of uh, car crashes, safety individualism, what, you name it, any of these frames – reduces your willingness to engage politically, to vote for climate policy, to vote for 15 minute cities, you name it. Yeah. Um, these frames have real impact. Yeah. Frame eight is knotted web. What's the knotted web frame? So, so there, there was a, a, a great piece of research from the early nineties. I'm blanking on the name of the author in the article now that, that found that this um, epidemiological technique of referring to webs of causality was harmful, um, that, that it confuses us, it makes us less, less likely to engage. And I, I realized it wasn't just webs. There was a number of other kinds of framing devices that were all focusing on this same kind of idea of interconnectedness, of complexity, 
of, of systems that was harmful because it limited our ability to understand what was going on. And so here I've got this slide, it, we talk, it talks about, it gives three examples of three different industries using this, this frame, and they're both using the word complex. So like the European Automobile Association says road safety is complex. Chevron says uh, climate change is complex. But it, you also have BMW saying that they're engaged in the circular economy. You know, the, you have this kind of use of these terms, complexity, web, et cetera, to, to make it seem like people are proposing a solution, but not one you could really put your finger on. What is a complex solution to global warming? What does that look like? How would we do that? Exactly. And, uh, and that brings us to our final of the nine uh, uh, devious frames, and that is the multifactorial uh, side of thing, which does sound awfully complex, too. <laughs> It's, it's also pretty uh, complicated, yeah. yeah. So this is a this is a slide from Philip Morris. Or, uh, sorry, not Philip Morris. And this is a tobacco industry internal memo that was confidential and it was leaked as part of the what are called the cigarette papers or the tobacco files. They were sent in cardboard boxes to Stanton Glantz at the University of San Francisco, uh, University of California, San Francisco. And this one shows that. The tobacco industry realized that it exists, its existing dark PR wasn't working, and it's proposing that they use what's called multifactorialism. So they should start saying that, you know, lung cancer isn't caused by cigarettes alone. It's caused by a combination of things. So we need a combined solution of many different kinds of interventions in order to stop lung cancer. And this was very successful, very successful. Yeah. That's a, almost a, a sign that they're 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 getting towards the end, <laughs> and, yeah. and you know, you know, it's like it, it's like here here BP once again, and they're starting to admit, oh yeah, we, we've got a problem here. But guess what? You know, it's it's multifactorial. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah, this is B, this is a slide from BP with their all of the above strategy. Um, you've also, you might've heard this concept of strategy called silver buckshot also. It, it doesn't make sense. You know, we're, why don't we do, why don't we prioritize, do what works best, what works fastest? We, this is a climate emergency. We need to take action. But BP would prefer that we just do it all, all at the same time. And then in the end, what tends to happen is you don't really do much of anything or at least nothing yeah. meaningful. Yeah. Great. I mean, I, I won't read this whole whole thing. It's quite long, but the the key words are: this is uh, Professor Leon Robinson. Robertson, he's a, a famous expert in road safety, and he's the Johns Hopkins University uh, uh, chair in injury prevention, or the chair was named after him. Uh, he says it does not logically follow that multifactorial theories or analysis lead to rational uh, prevention policy, and he gives an example of. Um, in New York, they apparently installed some kind of window barriers. And he says, what if we tried a multifactorial strategy and we went after the, the drunk parents and we went after the distracted children that we, that we probably would have implemented something meaningful like these win window barriers much later or perhaps not at the scale that was necessary. And he's saying that multifactorialism is treated as an axiom, but it's not it's not actually an axiom. It could very well be very completely fallacious. Yeah. And again, that brings us back to, uh, again, an overview of all nine of these de devious frames. And I, I want to emphasize that the whole point of all of this and in, in and to your point that, that you made earlier is it's not that we're we're saying that, you know, innovations and safety are bad uh, per se, but the way that these frames are being used is to distract us from getting to the problem at the very, very top, which is the continual subsidizing of these industries and this way of life in some ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I mean especially for, for global warming, the, the current number is something like $6 trillion a year. Governments around the world are paying to kill the planet. We're subsidizing fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuels that much. And in in, if in, in that context, to be told that we need to recycle to save the planet is such a, it's an insult. Yeah. It's just an insult. Yeah. 
And, and, and we can say the same thing about motordom and, and the addiction that we have to a car dependent lifestyle and economy that's, that's tied to that. Talk a little bit about the, the challenge that we have in front of us in the sense that um, one of the, the, the main critiques that you know people will have for this is yes we okay we get it we we can see now we can actually see how these nine devious frames are at work and are so insidious and and are shaping the way that we see things and more importantly they're they're used as distractions from us organizing and pushing for for change at the very very top but one of the critiques that I that I'm sure people are, are like is like, yeah, but the economy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you know, it's I mean, look at the, the desperate moves that, that governments are, uh, you know, they're genuflecting and, and bending over backwards to try to deal with inflation and they're you know, suppressing, you know, uh, the price at the pump so that we can drive more because it's so intergrained within our economy. It's like, yeah, Grant, this is great utopia that you, you have here. If we can kind of cut this off at the very, very top and, and cut those subsidies off, but will that destroy the worldwide global economy? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, any time you, you saw this study that came out, I believe in so the LA Times, it was republished there yesterday or the day before. The high speed, wide roads in urban areas are a drain on our economies. They're not, they're not good for our economies. Banning neighborhood daycare facilities yeah. is, not, is not good for our economy. Banning uh, multi-story homes, banning restaurants, bars, and shops in residential areas, that's not good for the economy. We've got a lot of successful economies around the world that don't use as much fossil fuels as other economies, that don't use cars as much, that don't drive with people that don't drive as much. The most economically productive places in the world have places, have very few vehicle kilometers per day per person. Um, New York is incredibly powerful economic center and people hardly drive there. Right. So I think this, this argument that uh, we're going to harm the economy somehow by removing the laws that are um, killing the planet and ourselves doesn't really have much merit to it. And the, the way forward that I'm proposing is not that, we, not that we do something different, only that we remove the barriers to good policymaking. Right. And talking about removing some of the barriers, and, 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 and you and I were, were talking about this the other day, is it's, it's like, what do we have to subtract you know, let's let's talk about, you know, removing something rather than like adding funding to be able to uh, to, to do something. It's like, how do we remove something? And so what we're talking about here is removing some of the ongoing insidious subsidies that are, you know, that are at the, 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 the root problem. Um, and, and so talk a little bit about these these root problems and then we'll go to the final slide and talk about, you know, really. How, how do we actually focus on the target of policy change and not get distracted by the false targets? Sure. So uh, the kinds of policies that we could get rid of are, I mean, minimum, minimum lot sizes, single family homes. When, when people say that they want to end the single family home, I think it's really bad framing. I mean, it's not that kind of needs to happen, but it's not the... It's not quite right. The framing really needs to be stop banning housing. Right. You know, why are we banning homes? It's like forced homelessness is what we should be calling it. End forced homelessness. When we say we want to end single family homes, it's like we're tacking people's houses. Nobody likes that. It's easy to get on the defensive. Um, but it's, but really, it's almost like what you're saying is, is, is it's not a war on cars. What we're talking about here is a war on car dependency, and we we want to see more freedom. We want to see freedom of choice in more than just one mobility mode. Yeah, we don't want forced car ownership. We're being forced to own cars. And uh, I think we need to adopt that framing a lot more because we we need to be subtracting these policies that are forcing us to have these things. The root cause 
of car dependency is we're being forced to drive cars by public policy, by bans on, on mixed-use zoning, by subsidies to the fossil fuel industry that, that artificially lower the price of, uh, of petrol and energy, gasoline, lot sizes, all of the things that we talked about before that end up leading to forced single-family zoning. Um, we need to end all of those things. We need to make it so that people don't have to drive so much. We need to make it so that it's not so cheap to burn so much energy. Yeah. Who's doing a good job at this? Any any countries, you know, at the, uh, you know, sort of like leading the way in terms of this? I mean, we, we obviously here in the United States, you know, we're, we're challenged in the sense that it's it's going to be kind of hard for us to to decouple ourselves from this level of corporate influence. But are there any stars in, in, from, from a democratic world perspective of, of you know, helping us to, to see a, a way forward? There are lots. There are lots. And I think the Netherlands gets so much good press and it's well-deserved. Um, but I think when you look at road deaths per capita and car- CO2 emissions and fossil fuel subsidies, you have quite a number of countries that are doing an excellent job. I mean, the UK, uh, on a, a much tighter budget, has almost the same road death rate as uh, Sweden. Um, I mean, they're doing a great job over there. I mean, and they're and they're fighting really hard to do to do better. Uh, in terms of fossil fuel subsidies, they're very low. But in terms of really succeeding in removing a lot of these harmful subsidies, New Zealand is the world leader. They got rid of their agricultural subsidies, I believe, in the 70s. I mean, the bulk of them. They're leading the global discussion to end fossil fuel subsidies. They just, as far, I forget exactly which policy it was, but I believe they ended single family zoning last year. They're doing a fantastic job. They've got a long way to go, but they're, they're definitely leading and pushing for these kinds of things. Yeah. And hopefully that's going to help them too, um, eliminating single family zoning, because they also are in a situation where it's very, very difficult to, to find housing. Uh, uh, housing is extremely expensive there. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I think that they made this decision out of political necessity. A, a total bar- bipartisan effort came out and just said, we can't do this anymore. Yeah, I hope I hope it helps them. They really do have quite a crisis there. Now, Grant, unfortunately, we've only scratched the surface of what is dark PR and what we do about it. Um, And it's unfair for me to like spring this last slide on you and say, okay, well, what do we do then? We know what we need to do. We've talked about it. We need to have political change at the very top. What we don't really need to do, and you don't spend a whole heck of a lot of time of how to go about it, but you spend enough uh, time to, to really uh, give us a, a little bit of a, a roadmap in terms of what we need to avoid. And the, those are the false targets. Talk a little bit more about uh, how we get meaningful change when it comes to policy change. So we, we spend a lot of time as advocates demanding change in one way or another. And it's important to recognize that there's, there is actually one, one target that we need to be focusing on. It is political change. It's political action. And we're, we're very easily have our energies diluted when we go after the CEO of a, of a company or corporations themselves. That's because corporations and CEOs respond, and I don't mean to be apologetic to them, but this is the state of the world. They respond to incentives. They respond to government policy. CEOs and corporations, albeit they try to influence government policy to their favor, they're responding to it in the way they act on a day-to-day basis. And the same goes, I mean, it gets a little bit into the, the, the sociolo- sociology of it, but the same for politicians, the same for plutocrats. The, these stakeholders are responding to the incentives around them that are set by politics, by government policy. And we need to be focusing on government policy. And one of the ways corporations try and distract us from government policy was to voluntarily say, I will be the woke CEO, or I will be what Joel Bacan calls the new corporation or the woke corporation, sometimes called. Uh, as well as the apologetic leader. Like if we focus our, our attention on the CEO. Exactly. And, and exactly. they're like, oh, uh, mia culpa, mia culpa. You know, it's like, again, it's these are false targets. In other words, it's shifting our focus away from po- political, political change. change. That's what yeah. we need to be laser focused on. And sometimes you'll hear corporations say we need a multi-stakeholder approach, yeah. um, that we need all hands on deck, that we yeah. need a, I mean, but this is just, um, 
this is like uh, somebody comes to rob your house and says, uh, you know, really to solve this problem tonight, we need to work together. Right. You know, <laughs> it's like uh, you, you don't uh, want to be getting entering into per the partnership with a person that is uh, trying to influence policy to have you killed. It's yeah. not a it's not a good, uh, good approach. <laughs> Talk a little bit. I, again, you, as I mentioned, you, you you don't spend the entire book talking about what we need to do now. That's probably book number two. <laughs> but uh, talk a little bit about. Okay, so we're now we're laser focused on what the target is: political change. Uh, at the very very top, we we need to be working on this. But just say a few words about. Okay, how how do we do that? Help us, Grant. How do we do that? We need to be organized. Uh, we need to spend organized. a lot of time organizing. Um, we get we're we're distracted from organizing now. I mean, I, I make the distinction between or, organic social movements and atomized social movements. And atomized social movements are those that are that's what that's what corporations are really promoting. They promote three three ideas: electoralism. They promote mobilizationism and what I call consumer investorism. They try and get, break us down into individual parts. So they say that democracy is just voting. Democracy is just protesting. You know, how did women get the right to vote? It was not voting. They did not vote themselves the right to vote because they didn't have the right to vote. They, they organized and they protested. And this is something that's been long demonstrated. This is not like uh, something new. We know that democracy is more than voting. But over and over again, you're hearing people say like, you need to get engaged, go vote. That's not enough. Get engaged, go organize, get together with four of your friends and uh, meet regularly, discuss the things that are important to you and your, your communities. Then go meet with your policymakers and then meet with other groups. This is the classic form of organizing in human history. This is how we organized the Million Man March. This is how the women's movements were organized. This is how we fought, I don't know the full way of saying it, CCFs to save the ozone. Um, this is how we got lead out of out of gasoline and out of paint. Uh, the history of improvement in so human society is one of people organizing together, coming together, uh, and demanding change from political actors. And we're 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 distracted by this just vote narrative. We're distracted by just protest. But protests, they're they're the symbol of uh, social movements. They're 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 the 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 external externalization of it, they are not those movements. They're just a, an emblem of them. And then the, the other way we're atomized is um, we're told that we can boycott stuff or we can divest. And I know it's a little bit controversial to say this kind of stuff doesn't work, but the, the evidence is really clear. The same with the, the, in, the inverse, boycotting and impact investing. You're not changing political structures by doing this. You're still operating with them in the market. And so well, there, these and are narratives... It, yeah. And I was going to say, I was going to jump in and say, and, and this is exactly what industries and, you know, and, and, and the powers that be want, because then it's, again, you use the term atomized, then it's like us acting as individuals, exactly. singular atoms versus coming together as a powerful group. I say this all the time in, in, in on the, on the channel and talking about well, what can we do as individuals? And one of the things that I come back and say is, you know, is you need to start talking with your neighbors. You need to start coming together. You need to start, come, you know, creating a group, a coalition. And, and you do go through this and we're not, not going to have time to, to cover that. But folks, you need to get this book. You need to listen to it or buy it to really dive deeper into this. But you know, one of the things I do say is, you know, you need to be communicating to your leadership, to your representatives, that this is what the community wants. This is what the community demands. And this is the expectation of our society, of our neighborhood, of our community. And and if they're not listening to you, you do need to vote them out. So there is a voting component. You do need to run a slate of candidates that, that will listen to your needs and do that. But the point about the electoralism uh, trap is the thinking that voting is enough. No, 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 no. It's, that's just the start. You know, that's making sure you've got the people, leadership in power that is, you feel committed are going to, you know, resist those temptations, resist that, the, the status quo of the system will fight to change the system, 
That's the whole point. We're trying to change the structure of the system that's getting us into this trap, uh, you know, getting to the root cause. But the other point of, of that is you, you can't just think that you're done. I did my voting. We got the person in power that we wanted. Now, you still have to be constantly making sure that there's follow through. Again, steering this tanker that we have, terrible analogy, but it's true, <laughs> it isn't going to uh, change. You know, it, it, I wasn't really meaning a tanker. We're, we're changing, t- turning this ship, and I'm thinking of a, of a, a sailboat. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying is, is, is that we have to be diligent and persistent and make sure that these changes, these difficult to achieve, structural changes do happen yeah absolutely absolutely i mean we got uh we we were all so happy when we got barack obama elected and then barack obama i mean a lot of great things about the guy but he increased fossil fuel subsidies almost every year he was not he was in office right uh you know and that's because we weren't we we assumed that we could politician blame. We could go after this false target. We got we got who we wanted. We got Bush out was the idea. And now we've got Barack Obama in, and now everything's taken care of. It, but it's not about politicians. Barack Obama uh, was responding to the same incentives around him. And we need to be changing that. We need You need to have a sustained push on government for the policy change that we, need, we want to be seeing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to pull pull up the uh, the title uh, of the book once again, the cover, and uh, and and basically give you the last word. Uh, what would you like to leave the the audience with, both the the visual, the vid- the viewing audience as well as the listening audience? I think uh, as we were as we were discussing, I continue with that. Go and meet with your friends, uh, organize, and and go out there and and change the change the status quo. Fantastic. Grant Ennis, it has been such a pleasure having you on the Active Towns Podcast. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Grant Ennis. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you are enjoying this content, please consider becoming an Active Towns ambassador. There's many ways that you can do so. You can just click on the link down below for the YouTube super thanks, as well as becoming an Active Towns Patreon supporter, uh, which actually gives you the ability to get all of this content uh, ad-free and early, so there's the bonus there, as well as uh, consider getting things from the Active Town Store. You know, we've got some really cool uh, Streets of Free People swag out there at the Active Town Store, uh, as well as if you are so inclined, uh, you can leave a donation with the nonprofit. All of that can be accessed on the website at activetowns.org. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.